From Plasse to Partition Chapter 6 The Age of Gandhian Politics Part 4 Civil Disobedience Movement For some time after the withdrawal of the non-cooperation movement, the Congress was not in a position to launch another round of mass movement. Gandhi since his release from prison in 1924 remained aloof from direct politics and concentrated his energies on constructive programs, such as the untouchability removal campaign, promotion of the use of charkha, spinning wheel, as a mark of self-help, and building up an ashram at Sabarmati where he would train a group of ideal satyadahis. The colonial government considered him to be a spent force, politically. This complacency was also due to the fact that the national consensus, which he had constructed a few years ago, broke down quickly and India witnessed a crisis of unity. The Congress itself became divided among the no-changers and pro-changers, the former wanting to stick to Gandhian ways, while the latter preferring to revert to constitutional politics. Gradually the constitutionalists became more powerful and under the leadership of C.R. Das and Motilal Nehru launched the Swaraj Party within the Congress. Their ambition was to participate in council politics and wreck the constitution from within. But the Swarajists were by no means a stable group or united by all India loyalty and discipline to achieve that mission. On the other hand, the growing influence of the Congress socialists under the young leaders Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhas Chandra Bose eventually led to a right-left confrontation within the party. The short-lived Muslim League Congress alliance was also jeopardized by the decline of the Khilafat movement. The Muslim League itself became divided among the supporters of joint electorate and separate electorate. Communal riots broke out in Kohat in the northwestern frontier. In Bengal, the Hindu-Muslim pact forged by C.R. Das in 1923 broke down, culminating in a fierce riot in Calcutta in April 1926. It was followed by a series of other riots in eastern Bengal between 1926 and 1931, as music before mosques became an emotional issue for rival communal mobilization in the countryside. In UP between 1923 and 1927 there were 88 riots, leading almost to a complete breakdown of Hindu-Muslim relations. In the election of 1925 to 1926 religious issues were freely exploited by Hindu Orthodox groups led by Madan Mohan Malvi, resulting in the defeat of the secularist Motilal Nehru. As a corollary, Hindu nationalist organizations, like the All India Hindu Mahasbha gained in strength in North and Central India, its close and problematic relationship with the Congress tarnished the latter's secular image and led to further alienation of the Muslims from mainstream nationalism. The untouchables too, whom Gandhi called Harijan, God's people, were frustrated as the campaign to ameliorate their conditions received lukewarm response throughout India. They were first organized in 1926 under the banner of an exclusive organization by Rao Bahadur M.C. Raja but in 1930 Dr. B.R. Ambedkar organized them into an all-India depressed classes congress with a clear anti-congress agenda. However, despite such fissures in organized political life, there were, on the other hand, some significant changes that prepared the ground for another round of mass agitation against the British Raj. First of all, a major crisis for the export-oriented colonial economy culminated in the Great Depression in the late 1920. The prices of exportable agricultural cash crops went down steeply, by about 50% in general, affecting the rich peasantry. The prices of some cash crops fell more drastically than others. The price of cotton, for example, grown in Punjab, Gujarat and Maharashtra, fell from 0.70 rupees per pound in the mid-1920 to 0.2 rupees in 1930. The price of wheat within a year fell from 5 rupees to 3 rupees per mon between 1929 and 1930. The price of rice began to fall a little later, from the beginning of 1931, when the jute market also crashed in Bengal. While the income of the peasantry was going down, the amount of revenue, settled previously in a condition of high prices, remained static, 
As government was not prepared to allow any remission to accommodate the price fall, still widely believed to be a temporary phenomenon. As landlords remained under pressure to pay revenue, there was no relenting in the pressure of rent on the tenants. And in such a situation debt servicing became a problem, as moneylenders were now more keen in recovering their capital. In many areas the flow of rural credit dried up, and the peasants were forced to sell parts of their land to raise the capital to keep cultivation going. However, the situation varied from region to region, and even within the same region such as Bengal, as Sukta Bose has shown, the effect varied widely depending on the structure of peasant society and organization of production. This situation helped Congress to mobilize the rich peasants and smallholders in various parts of the country, such as Bengal, coastal Andhra or UP. In the latter area, repeated crop failures and shortfall in the production of food crops also added to the miseries of the poor peasants. This led to the organization of peasant movements outside the Congress, as it was clearly not interested in mobilizing such potentially radical lower peasant groups. In Bengal too, poor Muslim, untouchable Namsudra and tribal Santhal peasants mobilized around radical agrarian demands in 1928-1929, representing what Tanika Sarkar has described as a parallel stream of protest. The environment was certainly conducive for a mass agitation if the local Congress leaders could relate the specific grievances of these peasants to the broader national agenda of Swaraj. But their major challenge was to reconcile the interests of the richer landowning peasants with the concerns of the labouring agricultural workers and tenants. The other important development was the emergence of a capitalist class during and in the years immediately following World War I. Fiscal needs forced the government of India to impose protective tariffs, pushing the prices of imported articles up, and thus helping unintentionally Indian industrialization. As a result, in the 1920 there was a powerful and conscious Indian capitalist class which organized itself in 1927 under the banner of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industries, FICSI. This was also the time when the Indian bourgeoisie was coming into conflict with the imperial government on many issues. Their usual way of handling the situation was to operate as a pressure group, but increasingly their leaders like G.D. Birla or Purushottam Das Thakur Das and even the moderate Lazi Naranji were coming to the conclusion that they would do better if they sided with the Congress to fight their battle. Many of the captains of Indian industries were the cotton mill owners of Western India who had reached the threshold of endurance as a result of depression and competition from cheap Japanese textiles. By the summer of 1930 the Bombay mill owners were left with record unsold stocks, 120,000 bales of cloth and 19,000 bales of yarn. Throwing their lot with the Congress now seemed to be an option worth trying. Congress too began to support many of their demands and made them into national issues, and thus began to attract the capitalist class to its side. But the problem was, there had also been a parallel expansion of the industrial working class and a rise in its political consciousness. The year 1928-1929 was the peak period of labour unrest in India, witnessing about 203 strikes spread over all parts of the country. Although the workers often exhibited considerable autonomy of action, one of the major reasons behind this enhanced labour activism was the penetration of communist influence in eastern India through the Workers' Peasants' Party and in Bombay through the Guinea Kamgar Union. By 1930, however, this communist influence declined as the government came down heavily on them with repressive measures, and the Comintern instructed them to keep distance from the Congress-led nationalist movement. This gave the Congress an opportunity to resurrect a broad united front, although working-class support for it was in general weak, except in Bengal, where their fight was against the British capitalists. But still the Congress tried to project itself as a supra-class entity and above interests and thus sought, although very clumsily, to bring in both the capitalists and the workers under the same banner, more in Chapter 7. Within such a cluttered context of discord and disorder, 
Indian politics was galvanized again from late 1927 when a Tory government in London appointed an all-white statutory commission under Sir John Simon to review the operation of the constitutional system in India. Non-inclusion of Indians in the commission provoked protests from all the political groups in India and resulted in a successful nationwide boycott participated by both Congress and the Muslim League. When the Simon Commission arrived in the country in early 1928, it was greeted with slogans like Go Back Simon. Motilal Nehru in this context started negotiating for a joint Hindu-Muslim constitutional scheme as a fitting reply, and at an all-parties conference in Lucknow in August 1928 the Nehru report was finalised. It was a bunch of uneasy compromises and therefore stood on shaky grounds. Its final fate was to be decided at the forthcoming Calcutta Congress in December 1928, and Motilal wanted Gandhi to throw his weight behind the scheme, so that it was accepted smoothly by the Congress. But for Gandhi, Swaraj was not a constitutional matter that the British could give. For the attainment of proper Swaraj, he had been mobilising the masses outside the Congress. If the Nehru report had been one entry point for Gandhi once again into the Congress-led nationalist politics, the other entry point was the Bardoli Satyagraha of 1928. Bardoli Taluka of Surat district in Gujarat was meant to be the site of a no-tax campaign during the non-cooperation movement. It could not take place as the movement was withdrawn and the peasants complied with the instructions of the Congress leaders to pay up their taxes without resistance. But the local leaders Kumvarji and his brother Kalyanji Mehta carried on their constructive programs in an area which was ideally suited to become an important stronghold of Gandhian politics. Its Patidal peasants had been recent immigrants to the area. With less social stratification, they were a homogeneous community organized by the Mehta since 1908 under the banner of the Patidal Yuvak Mandal. The local Kalipras Tiavan Bialis were completely under their control, being bound to them through debt servitude. Here a Taluka unit of the Congress was opened, along with a Bardoli Swaraj Sangh, through which the Mehta brothers organized not only the Patidar peasants, but also the Kalipras Tiavan Bialis who responded to their constructive work and skillful use of tribal religious symbols. So when the Bombay government in 1927 raised the land revenue by 22%, affecting a small but dominant landed class, consisting mainly of Patidar, Anavil Brahmins and Banyas, a good deal of social mobilisation had LED taken place for the starting of a no-revenue campaign. The Bardoli Satyagraha was launched on 4 February 1928 by Vallabh Bhai Patel, the President of the Gujarat Congress Committee with the blessings of Gandhi. Though Patel organised the movement on the spot with the help of local mediators, it was actually Gandhi's movement, as his image was constantly used for political mobilisation, both among the Patidar peasants and Kalipras Tiavan Bialis. The movement was widely reported in the national press, as it was a spectacular success. A judicial inquiry was initiated on the basis of which enhanced revenue rates were cut down, confiscated lands were returned and finally revenue revisions were abandoned, at least for the time being. The success of the Bardoli Satyagraha brought Gandhi once again into the limelight. It proved his point that Satyagraha was more effective than the constitutional methods. As Judith Brown has remarked, Bardoli lifted Gandhi out of the depression and the Calcutta Congress of December 1928 witnessed his re-emergence as a national leader. By that time the opposition to the Nehru report had become stronger. It contained a constitutional scheme that proposed dominion status for India, which was opposed by a radical younger group led by Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhas Chandra Bose. Both Nehru and Bose were in favour of complete independence. Even Muslim opposition to the report was increasing, as groups headed by Jinnah and Aga Khan repudiated it. So Gandhi proposed a compromise resolution, which adopted the Nehru report, but said that if the government did not accept it by 31st December 1930, the Congress would go in for a non-cooperation movement to achieve full independence. Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhas Bose were still unhappy 
But when Gandhi, as a further concession, cut down the time limit to 1929, the resolution was passed. In the open session, also Gandhi's compromise resolution was carried, while Bose's amendment demanding complete independence was lost. Thus, Gandhi once again came to dominate the Congress, but as Brown, 1977, says, he wanted to assume leadership only on his own terms. So he had a second resolution passed which contained a detailed program of constructive work. It involved revival of organizational work, removal of untouchability, boycott of foreign cloth, spread of khadi, temperance, village reconstruction, and removal of disabilities of women. It was through this constructive program that Gandhi hoped to achieve true Swaraj. But one important issue that this constructive program did not touch was Hindu-Muslim unity. Even after the Calcutta Congress, some Congress leaders outside the Nehrubos group, like the Liberals, preferred cooperation with the British. The then Viceroy, Lord Irwin, also wanted a reconciliation to introduce a constitutional scheme with a dominion status as the ultimate goal. He received the support of the Labour government in power, and hence came the Irwin offer of 31st October 1929, proposing a round-table conference to settle the issue. Gandhi was reluctant to reject it outright, but negotiations broke down, as the Congress leaders wanted the details of the dominion status to be discussed, and not just the principle. In December public attention shifted to Lahore where the next session of the Congress was going to be held with Jawaharlal Nehru as the president. Many leaders had reservations about starting a movement for full independence, particularly in view of the rising wave of violence spearheaded by revolutionary leaders like Bhagat Singh and others. So when Gandhi arrived in Lahore he had an uphill task and a lot of opposition to encounter, but in spite of everything his preferred resolution was passed. It defined the Congress goal as full independence, Opyuma Swaraj and proposed that as a preliminary to start a civil disobedience movement to achieve it, a boycott of legislature would begin immediately. The All India Congress Committee, AICC, was authorized to start a civil disobedience movement at an appropriate time. But Gandhi, as it seems, had not as yet been able to convince all his critics. The call for the boycott of legislatures evoked only limited response. Muslim members of the Congress, like Dr. Ansari, were unhappy, as communal unity they thought was an essential precondition for the success of a civil disobedience movement. Outside the Congress, the Muslim Conference and the Muslim League condemned the movement as a device to establish Hindu Raj. Similarly, Sikh support also seemed to have shifted away from Congress. Non-Congress Hindus, like the Hindu Mahasbha and the Justice Party in Madras declared their opposition to civil disobedience. Business groups were apprehensive about the uncertain possibilities of the Lahore Resolution, while young congressmen were pressing for more militant action. Under the circumstances, the celebration of the Independence Day on 26 January 1930 evoked little enthusiasm, except in Punjab, UP, Delhi and Bombay. In Bihar, the celebrations resulted in violent clashes between the police and the Congress volunteers. Gandhi had to devise a strategy to break out of this impasse and impute a broader meaning into the word independence, as opposed to its narrower political connotation that had such a divisive impact. On 31 January 1930 Gandhi therefore announced an 11-point ultimatum for Lord Irwin. If these demands were met by 11 March, he declared there would be no civil disobedience and the Congress would participate in any conference. It was a compromise formula, which included, according to Sumit Sarkar's classification, six issues of general interest, like reduction of military expenditure and civil service salaries, total prohibition, discharge of political prisoners not convicted of murder, reform of the CID and its popular control, and changes in the Arms Act, three specific bourgeois demands, like lowering of the rupee sterling exchange rate to its 4D protective tariff on foreign cloth and reservation of coastal traffic for Indian shipping companies, and to basically peasant themes, 
I. 50% reduction of land revenue and its subjection to legislative control and abolition of salt tax and government salt monopoly. It was a mixed package to appeal to a wide cross-section of political opinions and unite the Indians once again under one overarching political leadership. Gandhi thus related the abstract concept of independence to certain specific grievances, but of all grievances, salt tax seemed to be the most crucial one for many reasons. It affected all sections of the population and had no divisive implication. It did not threaten government finances or any vested interests and therefore would not alienate any of the non-Congress political elements, nor would provoke government repression. And finally, it could be made into a highly emotive issue with great publicity value. Irwin was in no mood to compromise, and hence on 12th March began Gandhi's historic Dandi march to the Gujarat seashore where on 6th April he publicly violated the SALT law. The march attracted enormous publicity both in India and overseas and was followed by wholesale illegal manufacture and sale of salt, accompanied by boycott of foreign cloth and liquor. In the next stage would come non-payment of revenue in the Ryotwari areas, non-payment of Chokidari taxes in the Zamindari areas and violation of forest laws in the central provinces. The Congress Working Committee had thus chalked out a program which would have less divisive impact on Indian society. But things began to take an abrupt turn towards the end of April, as violent activities and less disciplined mass upsurge began to take place in different parts of India. The most important of these was the armory raid in Chittagong in Bengal, followed by a spate of violent activities throughout the province. In Peshawar the masses became unruly after the arrest of the local charismatic leader Badshah Khan. Then in mid-May Gandhi himself was arrested. This was followed by a spontaneous textile strike in Sholapur, where the workers went around rampaging government buildings and other official targets in the city. All these encouraged in nearly all parts of India a mass movement that did not merely involve non-cooperation with a foreign government, but actual violation of its laws to achieve complete independence. Even the outbreak of violence in three areas did not immediately lead to withdrawal of the movement. In this sense, the civil disobedience movement, as Sumit Sarkar, 1983, has argued, witnessed a definite advance of radicalism over the 1920 movement. But at the same time, it was not an unqualified success. There was a discernible absence of Hindu-Muslim unity, no major labor participation, and the intelligentsia was not as involved as in the past. On the other hand, a new feature of the civil disobedience movement was a massive business support. They participated, at least during the initial period, into very fruitful ways, they provided the finance and supported the boycott movement, particularly that of foreign cloth. The value of imported cloth declined from £26 million in 1929 to £13.7 million in 1930. Depression partly contributed to this fall, but it cannot be explained without referring to the merchants' refusal to indent foreign cloth for a specific period. The other most important feature of the civil disobedience movement was large-scale women's participation. At almost every stop during the Dandi March, Women flocked in thousands to hear Gandhi, and once the movement was launched, they were fully incorporated into it. They participated in the picketing of shops dealing in foreign cloth and liquor, and at places processions participated by one to two thousand women astonished the whole country and bewildered the authorities. These women belonged mostly to the respectable families of the upper castes, such as the Brahman and Marwadi families in Barar or the Bhadralok and Orthodox Marwadi and Gujarati trading families in Bengal. Their appearance in the open street and participation in agitational politics did not jeopardize their respectability, as Gandhi's name legitimized such actions as sacred duties to the nation. As in urban areas, in the villages too, in Bengal for example, the peasant women considered it to be a religious mission to participate in the Gandhian movement and they belonged mostly to the upwardly mobile peasant castes. For, in the countryside in general, 
there was more participation from the richer peasantry, whose grievances against high revenue demands were successfully related to the demand for Swaraj. Non-payment of Chokidari taxes and revenue campaign became major features of the movement in parts of Gujarat, UP, Bihar, Orissa and coastal Andhra. This was accompanied by the boycott movement, widespread illegal manufacture of salt and picketing of liquor shops. And if the general people did not participate in these activities of their own accord, in some places, as in North Bihar, the village-level Congress enthusiasts used limited violence and other subtle forms of social coercion to force adherence to their boycott program. The government also retaliated with repressive measures. All front-ranking leaders and thousands of volunteers were arrested. From September 1930 onwards, the movement began to decline. In the urban areas, the enthusiasm of the mercantile classes were dampened by the financial losses because of the disruption of day-to-day -day business. The government also offered them a concession in February 1931 in the shape of a 5% surcharge on imported cotton piece goods. The middle class had been unenthusiastic from the beginning, and now the educated youth felt more attracted to militant nationalism. Bhagat Singh in Punjab who had assassinated a British officer and thrown bombs at the Legislative Assembly, and Benoy, Badal and Dinesh in Bengal, who had attacked the writer's building in Calcutta, became their heroes. On the other hand, working-class support was non-existent and given their recent radical propensities, Gandhi had reservations about involving them in the movement. One exception was Nagpur where working-class participation was massive and much more than in the 1921 movement. In the countryside, the enthusiasm of the richer peasantry, such as the Patidars of Gujarat or the Jats of UP, dissipated due to confiscation and sale of properties. On the other hand, drastic fall in agricultural prices resulted in the movement of the lesser peasantry acquiring radical tendencies, such as Norant campaigns in UP, violation of forest laws and tribal rebellions in parts of Andhra, CP, Maharashtra, Orissa, Bihar, Assam and Punjab. These developments might have serious divisive impact on society, which Gandhi certainly wanted to avoid. So the movement was withdrawn through the Gandhian Pact of 5 March 1931 and Congress agreed to participate in the second round table conference to discuss the future constitution of India. Interestingly, peasants in Orissa celebrated the truce as a victory for Gandhi and were further encouraged to stop paying taxes and manufacture salt. The Compromise of 1931 is, however, the subject of a major controversy in Indian history. It was R.J. More, 1974, who first pointed out that bourgeois pressure was a significant factor behind the compromise, a point which Sumit Sarkar, 1976, developed later to argue that the Indian bourgeoisie played a crucial role both in the initial success of the movement as well as in its subsequent withdrawal. This position has been accepted by other historians too across the ideological spectrum, like Judith Brown, 1977, Claude Markowitz, 1985, and Basudev Chatterjee, 1992. The alliance between Congress and the capitalists, it is argued, was uneasy and vulnerable from the very beginning and now uncontrolled mass movement unearthed the business classes who wanted to give peace a chance. Hence the pressure on Gandhi to return to constitutional politics and the result was the Gandhian Pact. But the problem with this thesis is that the business groups hardly represented a homogeneous class in 1931 and did not speak with one voice. As a D.D. Gordon puts it, the enthusiasm of the industrialists was dampened by the depression, Bokot, Hattals and the social disruptions, and they wanted either to destroy civil disobedience or broker a peace between Congress and the government. But on the other hand, the marketers and the traders still remained staunch supporters of Gandhi, and their radicalism even increased as civil disobedience made progress. More significantly, as other critics of this theory point out, Although business communities supported the movement and could partly claim credit for its early success, they were never in a position to pressurize Gandhi to withdraw the movement. 
Gandhian Congress was projecting itself as an umbrella organization which would incorporate all the different classes and communities. So it was highly unlikely that Gandhi would take such a vital decision only to satisfy the interests of one particular class. We shall return to this topic in the next chapter. For the present, it is important to remember that the most weighty reason for withdrawal of the movement was appearance of radicalism and violence among certain lower classes who refused to remain under the control of local Congress leaders. The movement was moving in wavered directions or going against the Gandhian creed of non-violence and was tearing apart the fragile unity of the political nation, hence the compromise and withdrawal. But the negotiations with the government failed and Gandhi returned empty-handed from the second round table conference in London held in September, December 1931. Congress had boycotted the first session of the conference, the second session deadlocked on the minority issue, as not just the Muslims, but all other minorities, such as the depressed classes, untouchables, Anglo-Indians, Indian Christians and Europeans demanded separate electorates, which Gandhi was adamant not to concede. He came back to India, and his only option was a renewal of the battle. There were other compulsions too, as government had already unleashed repression and in a preemptive strike banned the Congress on 4 January 1932. The movement was renewed with greater vigour, but evidently evoked less enthusiasm. The rich peasant groups, who had showed greater militancy during the first phase of the movement, felt betrayed by its withdrawal and remained unstirred in many places, such as coastal Andhra, Gujarat or UP, when the Congress leaders wanted to mobilize them the second time. Some aspects of the Gandhian social program, such as his crusade against untouchability, simply did not appeal to them, belonging mostly to the higher castes, and even evoked hostile responses. On the other hand, Gandhi's Harijan campaign failed to impress the Harijans themselves. In Marathi-speaking Nagpur and Barar, which had been the strongholds of Ambedkar's Dalit, untouchable, politics, the untouchables refused to switch their allegiance to the Congress. However, side by side with this apathy and antipathy, there were also signs of more radicalism among certain other sections of the lower peasantry, expressed through salt satyagrahas, forest satyagrahas, non-payment of chokidari taxes, no rent and no revenue campaigns. But these were movements largely outside the ambit of Congress organization, and so at places Congress leaders tried to exert a moderating influence on them, or where this was not possible, sought to distance themselves from such peasant militancy. In the urban areas, the business groups were certainly ambivalent. There was an open estrangement between the Congress and the Bombay Milloners, who under the leadership of Homi Modi warned Gandhi against a renewal of the movement. The other sections of the Indian big business were in a dilemma. Their hope for concessions from the government had been belied, but a renewal of civil disobedience might this time seriously threaten the social status quo, as government was more prepared for a counter-offensive. Under the strain of this dilemma, Argues Claude Markowitz, 1985, the unity of the Indian capitalist class broke down. By 1933, the weakening economy and growing violence even crushed the enthusiasm of the staunchest of Gandhian supporters, the Gujarati and Marwadi merchants. The urban intelligentsia also felt less inclined to follow the Gandhian path. Picketing of shops was frequently punctuated by the use of bombs, which Gandhi condemned but failed to stop. The labor remained apathetic and the Muslims often antagonistic. Government repression saw thousands of Congress volunteers behind bars. The movement gradually declined by 1934. For Congress, however, the civil disobedience movement was by no means a failure. It had by now mobilized great political support and gained a moral authority which were converted into a massive electoral victory in 1937. In this first election under the Government of India Act of 1935, which offered franchise to a larger electorate, Congress achieved absolute majority in five out of eleven provinces, i.e. Madras, Bihar, Orissa, CP and UP. 
near majority in Bombay and became the single largest party in Bengal, which was a Muslim majority province. For most of the Indians, especially Hindus, it was a vote for Gandhiji and the yellow box, and it registered their expectation for some real socio-economic changes promised recently by the socialists and other left-wing Congress leaders. The subsequent ministry formation in eight provinces, UP, Bihar, Orissa, CP, Bombay, Madras, Northwest Frontier Province and Assam, was Congress's first association with the apparatus of power. But this office acceptance also symbolized the victory within Congress command structures of the right-wingers who preferred constitutional politics to agitational methods of Gandhi. As D. A. Lowe has argued, while fighting the British Raj, the Congress itself was becoming the Raj and was gradually drifting away from the Gandhian ideal of Swaraj. If you like this video so please do like, share this video and hit the subscribe button.